Are we going to say the same thing? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. We're going to try this again. I'm Richard. Oh, Hi, I'm Tracy. Here with Tracy. <laughs> we're resetting this up. So we were told the feed was somehow bad. Well, uh, we'll see how that goes this time. Um, thanks for staying with us. So we're only 10 minutes off schedule. Uh, hopefully, this will be fine. Uh, I just want to say welcome to a uh, new episode, new installment of Intelligent Disclosure with Richard Dolan. Uh, there we are. Hi, and everybody. there's Tracy. Everyone's saying hello. <laughs> Yay, we're back. <laughs> Actually, this is good because we can see ourselves. I think this yes, is going to have to be our system from now on. Yes, we tried something. I mean, I don't think that, I think we just had some bad internet problem. I don't know what happened, but this is much better. Well, uh, yeah, and uh, and I can see people are saying much better quality. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good. Let me crank up. We didn't the know a it, bit. it was. It seemed fine, so I'm glad we got to hear from everybody else as to what was really going on. So, um, right. we will start. We will kept going, so we are going to back up. <laughs> well, well, let's we'll start over. I'm going to start over, then you do your thing, and we'll yeah. Already. Okay. So this, uh, I want to talk today about, uh, and I, this is a. A longish kind of uh, presentation I want to give you tonight, uh, relating the whole phenomenon of aliens or apparent aliens that look human. What's going on with that? Is that an actual genuine phenomenon or not? I think the answer is that it is, but there's a lot that I I'd like to say to you about that. Um, but before we do that, I think Tracy, uh, you have a couple of things. <laughs> we're going to do this, yeah, do this over. So yeah, we're doing it over. So. What we were saying before it cut out, we were just sort of reviewing what's happened the last few weeks, uh, what Richard's been up to. So we were talking about the KGRA show. Richard uh, did a really interesting interview with Ryan Stacy of uh, Canada MUFON. He comes to MUFON from a uh, genuine investigative background, not, not MUFON investigator, but a private investigator. Yeah. So uh, his was his interview was really interesting. So that is up on our YouTube channel. Last week was Gordon White, who was also super interesting. He's uh, from Australia, lives in Adelaide. And uh, you two had a fascinating Loved interview. Loved that interview, yeah. And you said that Gordon had one of those interesting takes you'd ever heard on Gobekli Tepe. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we we could get into that, but actually that, that whole interview will be on our YouTube channel. Yep, it's going to be up uh, soon. The one with Ryan Stacy is on our YouTube channel, and I just wanted to mention Ryan has in the, the final segment of that interview one of the craziest, most fascinating UFO cases I've heard in a long time, and uh, so you want to check that out. But anyway, then we had one other interview. Yes, after Gordon. I just wanted to say one more thing about Gordon because you absolutely loved his book. Yeah, Starship. He's writing Starship. So uh, just wanted to mention that. Uh, human, uh, I keep getting the subtitle wrong. Starships, uh, a prehistory of the spirit. And um, for subscribers, we always do an APRE interview. So a little bit more candid afterwards. So we do have a really cool after interview with Ryan and with uh, Gordon. And then this Monday that just passed, there was a great KGRA show uh, with Chuck Fay of Hong Kong. We were just talking about that when we didn't know the feed was so bad for you. Uh, it was super interesting interviewing him because there's really a big difference in ufology between uh, Hong Kong and the rest of China. This is one of the main things that he helped us to understand. Oh yeah. I found it particularly interesting um, there's something in the rest of China called Oriental Ufology, according to him. And uh, it encompasses Chinese mythology. And it really, do you want, can you explain it a little bit better? Yeah, well, it's um, what you what you learn with listening to Chuck, who, by the way, is very, very articulate, really knows yeah. his English is excellent. He kept apologizing for his English, which there was no need. He was so uh, great to listen to. But he pointed out that in China, there's still a, a very strong attachment among many of the Chinese to their ancient mythological origins. Mm -hmm. And uh, what he reminded or he told us is that uh, in the Chinese belief system, they all descended from the dragons. Mm -hmm. And these yeah. dragons were from the sky. So they have their own sky mythology that's very, very powerful for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, in other words, I think what he was saying with the Oriental ufology is simply... I got the idea that it incorporated a lot of this idea about ancient yes. ancient aliens, Chinese version of the ancient aliens hypothesis. 
Yeah, so Hong Kong is kind of really disassociated from that. So there are, there are these two different uh, aspects of ufology. So we're lo really looking forward to doing an interview on the rest of China as well. And we have, uh, we have at least one person, maybe more, lined up for that. So that'll be very interesting. Uh, stay tuned for that. Yep. So that's what's been going on with KGRA. On a personal note, come on. We got to tell these people. Okay. Do you want to or shall I? You tell them. No, it's not a big I... deal to you. It's a big deal to me. <laughs> it's a big deal. To... It's a big deal to us. Tracy got her green card, which makes her a permanent resident of the United States. So there Yay. you go. Canadian <laughs> living in America. We just yeah. made the United States a little bit politer. <laughs> a little bit more polite. We're going to have to start. You don't wear red at all. I don't know what's up with that. You make up for that. That's one thing you don't know. This is Captain Canada, according to his son. <laughs> yes, My mother yes. makes sure to dress him in lots of Canadian red. So, <laughs> Well, one day there is a version of me singing the Canadian National Anthem, which is a, kind of a covert thing there. It's, it's, a, it's available, but uh, not readily. And I, let's just say I had fun with it. It's up on the members. Side. It's up. It's up there. So, um, but anyway, so Tracy's got her permanent residency. So that was a big deal of the U.S. That was a big deal to us. So we've been going through some stuff with that, and finally, it's that. come to a close, so we can relax now. And oh man, that was a big thing. Yeah, it was a big thing. Anyone who's gone through the immigration process yeah. uh, knows it's a lot of work and uh, and no small amount of stress. But anyway, you yeah. got through it, and and we're neighbors. Neighbors, Canada, U.S. So it's That's right. yeah. It, it sometimes it seems silly though, but anyways. So that was KGRA. Anything else? No, I think we should jump in. Okay, let's do it. It's an interesting topic tonight. All right. So, oh, uh, just to introduce again, anyone who's here for the first time, uh, Lori and Michael, who are helping to moderate the chat. You'll see them under Pursuing X. We couldn't do this without them. They're absolutely amazing. Uh, so. Have a great time in the chat, and uh, we'll come back with a couple questions at the end. But right now, Richard's going to take it away, and I'm going to scoot move out. There. Yep. Okay, perf perfect. So, um, so I wanted to talk about this this theme um, in part because uh, of a book that I've been reading just lately, and I'm, I'm going to show you that book uh, in a short while. But also, it's it's true that over the years I've collected. Uh, quite a few stories of uh, of individuals who have had encounters with with people who look exactly like human beings, but who don't seem exactly like the your ordinary run of the mill human being. Uh, to it, these individuals uh, appear to be highly telepathic, um, intensely intense telepathic, and, and to the uh, point where uh, the person hears certain uh, words in their mind that they're convinced are coming from these other individuals. Uh, I've, I've gotten uh, several of these stories. There's two that I've uh, recounted many, many times, and I'm not going to go into great detail here, but I'll just uh, very briefly mention them. Uh, and there's quite a few others. So I kind of like uh, sitting on the couch, by the way. I think this is a, a method that we're going to stick to. Um, and then there's a number of cases that other researchers have also... Um, come across that I want to share with you. And then what I would like to do is uh, think about some of the implications of this. There are important implications of, of these types of stories. I think the first thing that I will mention is 25 years ago, when I first began researching UFOs, uh, I took these types of stories uh, as not serious at all. Um, you know, we tend to think of the stories from the 1950s, the so-called contactee stories of people who claim to have uh, contact with, you know, beautiful blonde male, female uh, humans from another planet, whether it's Venus or some other place. And there was always a message involved and, and it always seemed very cultish, cult-like, and it was very easy to dismiss those. And I absolutely dismissed every one of those, those are the so-called contactees. We think of people like George Adamski, um, Howard Menger, and there's uh, many, many, many others, American and non-American around the world. These stories uh, were rife with in the early era of ufology. In fact, just as a personal note, I'll, I'll uh, mention that one of my first connections in the city of Rochester, New York, where I live, 
when I was researching this back in the 1990s, was a very elderly gentleman, and I mean gentleman, uh, named William Sherwood. Bill's no longer alive, uh, but we became very good friends. And uh, Bill was one of the most knowledgeable people in UFOs I've ever known. He was a retired engineer at Eastman Kodak and um, knew all of the, the technical details of the UFO phenomenon, but was deeply interested in the contactee stuff. And I always thought, ah, George Adamski. Bill had been a friend, a personal friend of George Adamski. And I knew a lot of the other contactees over the years. And I was never able to square uh, this incredibly uh, intelligent, sophisticated man who spoke multiple languages, fluent German, learned Japanese in his 70s, learned Portuguese in his 70s, uh, incredibly intelligent with this whole idea of these contactees, which I had always dismissed. Well, that was 25 years ago. Uh, what do I think of the contactees today? Well, let me walk through uh, the next 30, 40 minutes, and we'll, we'll see where we end up with all of this. I guess I can say that I've been going through a 25-year evolution on this phenomenon, and that includes a whole uh, phenomenon of human-looking aliens. So uh, let me recount some of the uh, stories that I have discussed many, many times, and I'm going to do it very briefly. So one story that came to me uh, a number of years ago was from a woman. She came to me with her husband, and she told me about being a teenage girl uh, in a church in western Pennsylvania with her mother in the mid-1960s. So this was quite a while ago. And she told me about how this beautiful blonde couple, male and female, sat directly in front of her in the church. And as in this very small town, everyone knew everyone, particularly in church, and she had never seen these people before. She was blown away by their clothing, which was incredible blue uh, fabric, which she had never seen anything that amazing before, she said. And she was amazed that no one had noticed these people. No one seemed to be paying attention to them, even though they were apparently the most obvious uh, thing in the whole church, this supermodel male, female, blonde couple in blue, bright blue clothing. Now, you would think that would be quite noticeable. So while she's thinking and focusing, fixating on them, she said to me, all these years later, she said, at that point, I heard them in my mind. And what she heard was a conversation between the two of them, which went something like, yes, we appear to be fitting in very well here. And to which the other one said, yes, except for the girl behind us who can hear us. And at that point, she, her eyes got very big, I think. And, uh, but that, she didn't hear anything else after that. It was as if, uh, if you believe that she was telepathically receiving them, it would be as if they shut it down and she couldn't hear anything after that. The rest of church went on, mass ended, and, uh, and they left. They bolted out really fast. And she decided in this moment of bravery to follow them fast. And she worked her way through the crowd her mother was oblivious to the whole situation. Chase uh, called after her, but she just went. She saw them outside in the, in the parking lot, going fast across the parking lot. She went after them. They went down a hill over, over this little crest in a hill. And she went up there and she saw them going into this, across the field into this wooded area. She starts going down the hill and then stopped dead in her tracks because she saw a third figure, which she, she described as, she said, remember the character Lurch from the Adams Family TV show? Of course, everyone remembers that. I said, yes. She said, well, he looked just like that guy. He was standing at the edge of the woods. It intimidated her. And she stopped and she watched this blonde couple walk up to the tall figure who was wear wearing a black suit, a uh, black hat of some sort. And they go in. He turns around, goes into the woods and follows them. And that's the end of that. And she never sees him again. Strange story. I heard a similar story from a retired Air Force colonel who was a PhD uh, who told me this story with his wife. Uh, at another event where I was, and in this case, it was a, a blonde-looking male-female uh, couple that was very telepathic in Las Vegas at a Las Vegas casino, of all places. Um, he was with his wife, and they were with another friend who he said was kind of like psychic. And um, long and, and short of that one was uh, he followed them down an escalator, and he heard them thinking to each other in their mind about him. And the conversation was something like, yes, 
he hears us, he's not important, he's not part of the program, just ignore him. Um, his, the man's, the colonel's wife and friend were watching this whole thing, uh, actually peeking behind a, from a slot machine <laughs> because they were so afraid of what was, uh, who these people were. Um, and then the follow-up to that was almost even freakier or stranger. He uh, agreed to uh, meet with the psychic who was also a hypnotherapist. She was going to regress him to uh, see if he could learn more of what this couple were actually saying. You know, He tries to do a regression a few days later at her home, and all they hear is construction noises outside, jackhammers and the like. Every time they investigate, the noise would stop, but it continued every time they attempted to do the hypnosis. So they gave up. And he said, no problem. I'll be back in about a month. We can do it then. I'll come visit you. She said, great. A month goes by. He calls her and says, hey, I'm going to be in town tomorrow. How about we do that regression? Her response was, what regression? What are you talking about? He says, don't you remember last month? Uh, this woman had no memory of anything that had happened the month before. Very, very bizarre story. So those are two stories that have come to me of human beings. We don't know that they're alien, but um, that's the inference, right? You wonder, like these are very unusual human beings. They're in intensely telepathic and uh, they don't seem like they come from around here. Um, there was another story that's come to me. I call it the human suit story. Uh, this is published on uh, at Richard Ola Members. And this is a, a woman I interviewed um, about a decade ago. She had been a student in the late 90s in England uh, where she boarded a train from uh, Stratford-upon-Avon going to Swansea, Wales. And along the way, it was a very crowded, crowded train car. And she had a very bizarre experience in this crowded train car. It appeared that these individuals were not, were not human. Um, she was adamant to me. And this is a very, very low-key, intelligent person, I have to say, that one of the individuals was literally un unraveling in part of his skin. She said it wasn't skin. It was like a cloth. I said, seriously? She said, absolutely seriously. And again, this is a, a woman with a very responsible job. She's very, very um, low-key, not looking for attention in any way. Um, there's more to that story. Uh, I have told it from time to time, and it, again, it's on my website. Um, again, this is another case and where that entire train car appeared to be filled with these types of people. Um, and then there's um, other stories that other individuals have told, some of them rather famous. The, the researcher Timothy Good of the UK um, had a story where he was at a, um, on a train or in a, in a train station, I believe, or possibly an airport, I've got to check this now, where he uh, encountered a man who he was convinced was a telepathic non-human, and it was because he had put out a message, uh, a conscious message for such individuals if they were here to please come and sit across from him. Uh, at some point, a very unusual man did so, sat directly across from him in such a way that made Tim Good believe that this was not a human. And um, if I recall this correctly, Tim put out the mental thought of saying, if you are an extraterrestrial, would please uh, touch your nose in this manner or, or something like this. Uh, and according to Tim, that's exactly what this man did. Uh, there was a, a, a little bit more of a follow-up to this, but somehow there was no conversation uh, that took place. And I think that was very frustrating for Timothy Good. If you know anything about Timothy Good, you know he's a, an extremely responsible researcher. Then there's a story from uh, the late Ingo Swan, the famous remote viewer. Um, I was fortunate to, to meet Ingo Swan, and uh, as I mentioned a few times, I actually visited him uh, a little over a decade ago in his home in uh, the Bowery in New York City, um, and I got to chat with Ingo quite a bit. Uh, famously, Ingo had a series of encounters with a, a mysterious Mr. Axelrod back in the 1970s. Uh, some of those encounters involved what I, I would say are non-human humans <laughs> or human-looking aliens. One was in a, a supermarket uh, with a woman that Ingo felt compelled to get close to. Um, and that when he got close enough to her, he had this moment of terror in which he was convinced that she was not a human being. Um, 
there was m many other things to the story that convinced him of that truth. Um, one thing was that these two individuals who he had known in another context were standing right there, basically working security for him. Um, and uh, to me, I've always thought that that was a test for Ingo Swan to see whether or not he could detect human beings, um, excuse me, detect aliens disguised as human beings. And I think the answer was that he could. Um, there was a lot about his encounters with this mysterious Mr. Axelrod that made me believe exactly that. So that's Ingo Swan. Um, I've been reading this book by an Australian researcher, Moira McGee. Uh, this is called The Alien Gene. And uh, I was given this by Moira, Moira the last time I was in Australia. Um, I, have a, I have a lot of regard for Moira. She's been researching UFOs for a very long time. And um, I think it might be fair to say that she's, um, well, Australia has a lot of excellent experienced UFO researchers, but it really might be fair to say that Moira is the dean of, of the writers of the UFO genre. She's written a number of excellent books on this. And they're good books. Um, what I like about her writing is she um, she approaches a subject the way that I like to approach a subject. So that is with um, with enough courage to look at these strange stories, but with enough of a level head so as not to get carried away and say, oh, yes, everything is true. She's got a critical acumen, which is very much needed in this field. So uh, the reason I'm mentioning this book here, The Alien Gene, is simply because, and going through it, uh, she, uh, one of the elements of this is that she recounts a number of cases of encounters by individuals with human-seeming non-humans. Uh, and I was actually really pleased that there were so many of these. I'll just, I'll just read... Um, this one, um, it's maybe a page and a half uh, from 1954. Um, and what I've learned is that there's a, a lot of these that go back even prior to the 1950s. And she kept, uh, collects them from around the world. And uh, I don't think Moira is going to mind if I read this one section. So hopefully, Moira, if you're out there, um, I'm going to interview you soon, by the way. So uh, she writes here of Cyril Jones, a photographer who had his own private pilot's license, reported a strange incident that happened Thanksgiving morning in 1954. He was only 16. He was the youngest employee at a service station in Northwestern USA. The weather was dreadful. At about 10 a.m., a very unkempt man came in. Uh, the man was about five feet eight tall, medium build with clear gray eyes and salt and pepper hair. So seemed like a normal guy coming in. He had obviously been traveling for some time as he had uh, a growth of stubble on his beard. His shoes looked old. And uh, so the stranger said that he, uh, I'm going to skip over a little bit here. Um, he had a little bit of work on his transmission that he was going to do. His car was not running well. Again, this is 1954. And he mentioned that he was driving to save a friend who had cancer. Uh, and that he believed he could save him. Time was of the essence. He had already been traveling down from Alaska, and the transmission on his car had just uh, gone bad after traveling all through Canada. So he asked if they, he could use their shop to uh, repair his transmission. So they're like, the workmen in the garage are like, this guy's crazy. But Cyril goes and... Uh, and... Um, Oh, yeah. And, and he says that the man was able to lip read the workers who said he was he was full of it. And the man says to Cyril that. Uh, Cyril's wondering if he can read their thoughts because of how he was seemingly able to relay their conversation by seemingly lip reading. Cyril's thinking, is this guy for real? Uh, and where did this guy come from? And the man looked straight him in the straight in the eye and said, young man. I am very real. They then pushed the broken down car into the workshop. Cyril was fascinated and astounded with the array of instruments that covered the man's dashboard. This is 1954. And unfamiliar items in the trunk. The stranger worked with precision and expertise when repairing his vehicle. And Cyril realized he seemed a well-educated and intelligent man. 
Except for his mind reading trick, he seemed like anyone else. Yet there was something about him that was not ordinary. As he worked, he spoke to Cyril in a quiet, articulate manner. Cyril had thought he was in his 50s, but the man told him he was very old, had outlived several wives, had many children, great grandchildren, and great grandchildren. He spoke of living in various parts of the world and his many adventures. Uh, he turned the conversation to the Andes and the Himalayas, where there were ruins of mysterious cities. He spoke of beings from elsewhere in the universe who landed their spacecraft there and other places on Earth which had special powers for those who knew how to tap into them. He went on to say there were beings who exist just beyond our ability to see in a different dimension. This is 1954. They were here to help and protect us in our hour of need, but we had to believe and sincerely seek them out. Primitive people made contacts all, all the time, but we, that is early people had, but we modern humans had lost the ability once we became civilized. Cyril asked him about the pyramids and was told the Great Pyramid was built by an ancient race of people who had since vanished from Earth. It was not a tomb, said the man, but a mathematical statement about this planet and its relationship with the sun, solar system, and universe. He went on to explain auras, the invisible force field around all living things, the psychic and telepathic abilities. We were all born with these gifts, but our culture teaches us from an early age not to trust such abilities. The stranger continued talking and explaining the entire time he was repairing his car. Although Cyril didn't understand everything he talked about, he got the occasional opportunity to ask a question out loud. For the most part, the stranger seemed to anticipate what he was going to ask. As Cyril watched, the man repaired his car in record time with incredible speed and precision. After about an hour, he closed the trunk, pressed the starter button, and the engine sprang into life. Before donning his old trench coat, he shook Cyril's hand and thanked him, saying, There is not enough time to tell you much today. Look into these matters on your own and keep an open mind. You'll be a better person for it. And uh, Cyril, Cyril asked himself, was the stranger in the storm from here or out there? Lots of these stories. And they're suggestive. You don't really know what they are. Um, are there just human beings who've got these telepathic abilities? Are they non-humans that come from elsewhere? Uh, and so on. And, you know, I, I don't have the answer to this any more than any other researcher does. But I will say that um, I've been wondering about this phenomenon. Um, and let's ask a few questions about this, all right? So one thing that I think we really need to consider is that these types of stories are true, that they're real. Because frankly, of the ones that I've just recounted, there's dozens more, dozens more that I could throw out at you right now. Um, they just keep coming. Um, I recall a conversation I had years ago with Linda Moulton Howe about her, a contact that she had with the Defense Intelligence Agency. Linda's talked about this many times. Who just sat down with her and said, look, there are three times of non-human beings that we monitor, that we have monitored. Um, gray type humanoids with the big black eyes, reptilian types of beings, and blonde Nordic types of human beings. Uh, they don't get along and there's all of this issues. Uh, but he also indicated that a number of them have infiltrated human society. This is, gets a, a lot of, you know, um, invasion of the body snatchers type scenario. Um, one of them, he said, actually was prominent in the World Bank, and another one was prominent in various governments, governments around the world, and so forth. There's a story of the late remote viewer Pat Price, who I and many are quite convinced was murdered back in 1975. Price was doing a series of remote views. Uh, in his spare time, and uh, walked into the office of Hal Puthoff one day and said, by the way, I've just been remote viewing this on my own. I thought I'd like to tell you, uh, Price being possibly the greatest remote viewer that, uh, that we've ever known about, frankly. He said, there are alien bases in a number of uh, regions on Earth. One is in the Pyrenees, the mountains between Spain and France. One is in Alaska at, in a place called Mount Hayes. He said, incidentally, that one is heavily guarded by the United States government or elements within the United States government. So you'll never, you'll never have the opportunity to investigate. 
He mentioned one in Zimbabwe and one in Western Australia, which he described as, um, let's say, a non-comical version of the of the alien um, uh, kind of Grand Central Station of Men in Black, the movie, if you recall that. Uh, in other words, a place where all of these aliens were meeting, kind of like a, a meeting point. Anyway, Pat Price's uh, statement that the facility in Alaska was heavily guarded by United States national security tells me a couple of things. A, it makes me wonder about the psychic uh, telepathic traveler who was coming down from through Alaska, if you recall that story. Um, is there a connection there? I really do wonder. Uh, but also it makes you wonder about, um, you know, to what extent these other beings would have infiltrated the human power structure that we have. If these stories go very far back in time, and they, they very well may, then these individuals would have had ample opportunity to insert themselves into the human power structure. Now, let me speculate a little bit about how this whole thing might have turned out. What, let's say that there are these human beings with intensely telepathic capabilities, and they are a, they know that they're very separate all right, from the rest of us. So what are they? Are they aliens from another planet? Or are they something else? Well, I'll give you my opinion. I think it's very unlikely in the extreme that another planet is going to uh, independently evolve people who look just like us. I mean, I suppose anything's possible, but I, I think of it as a very unlikely scenario. If you study the history of the development and evolution of life on Earth, um, it seems to me that human beings look as we do in the variety that we do. There are very specific geographical reasons for that. And I doubt, or at least I'm doubtful, that uh, another planet's going to reproduce those conditions that would create people who have five fingers on each hand, five toes, and, and all of that stuff. Uh, tetrapods is what they call us, I think, the biologists. Um, not impossible, but again, it seems unlikely to me. It seems much more likely that these human looking people that we encounter are human beings, just like us, that have red blood, they bleed like us, they have lifespans like us, uh, maybe longer, but they live and die uh, as we do. And that they're from here. Um, conversation I had with another researcher years ago, I thought was very, very suggestive and I've, I've never lost this notion. He said, you know, what if uh, a number of aliens 5,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago were, were uh, scoping out this planet and wanted to breed their own brand of humans? Maybe they went up to uh, the northern areas. We all hear about these blonde Nordic aliens. Maybe they took 5,000 or 10,000 of their own, stole them and, and kept them forever after to breed them. Well, actually, why not? Um, when you really think about it, if you were to take such a group of people, and in fact, I'm not necessarily endorsing this. I have some other ideas here, but that's a possibility in that um, you would have a group of humans that you're completely transforming from their natural culture. You're making them just like you, essentially, an alien culture. You're having them do work for you. They would be very useful to insert into the human society in whatever way you want. Uh, they would certainly have very little in common with the native people on planet Earth. So, yes, uh, there's abduction uh, experiences that are recounted by many people. I'm thinking of Travis Walton as just one example, where humans and non-humans are seen on the same craft. Well, maybe that's one of the possible answers. Another possible answer, and one that I've, I've, I can't stop wondering about, would be some version of an ancient breakaway civilization. So we think of the development of modern human beings, which according to the latest scientific genetics and um, archeological evidence, we're roughly, we're told, about 200,000 years old. That is anatomically modern human beings, roughly 200,000 years ago, years old, out of Africa. So that being the case, um, you know, for all but the last 10,000 years or so, roughly speaking, human beings have 
we believe, been nothing but hunter-gatherer types. And I don't mean to demean hunting and gathering because that's a lot of work and that uh, takes actually a lot of planning and foresight to be a successful hunter-gatherer. But as far as we can tell, that's the full human history right there. But I keep wondering, when we think of sites like Gobekli Tepe, which are very, very old, 10,000 years or more, where you have, uh, as Gordon White put it, the cathedral is built before we had cities. Gobekli Tepe, he argues, was a cathedral. I think he may be right. So is it possible that at some point in our ancient history, there was a fully human civilization that rose and collapsed uh, and that left behind esoteric knowledge of one sort or another that never, never left. If that were the case, you would then have a very, very select group of people living here, right? But not necessarily sharing that knowledge with the rest of humanity, which they would probably consider barbaric in one way or another. And you would have a, a kind of a secret society that would exist throughout human history with advanced knowledge of some sort. But it, it could also be that they would have advanced knowledge, but not necessarily the technology to do space travel. Um, maybe they didn't have the, cap the infrastructure for that, and who knows? So there could be a lot of things going on here, but uh, a society and a civilization that would be fundamentally separate, but not maybe large enough or strong enough to assert itself openly. Just a thought. And uh, look, I, I'm the first to admit it could be completely wrong. Um, I think of these things kind of as thought exercises. And uh, some of these ideas may never be provable one way or the other. But what I will say, going back to this idea of, of human looking non-humans or human looking aliens, if that's what they are, is that in fact, I think, um, I think we're dealing with uh, a clandestine presence that has been very successful, very successful at going below the radar of our civilization for a very, very long time. That um, there, I don't know if they have a, a what we would consider a positive, uh, you know, motivation or a negative motivation as far as humanity is concerned. Uh, my guess is that like any group, they're looking out for their best interests, whatever those happen to be. Um, you could certainly imagine though, go back a thousand years, say, look at medieval Europe. If uh, there were such a group that had telepathy or a group that had esoteric knowledge that were very, very advanced, they would almost certainly not feel comfortable with letting that information out. I mean, they'd be burned alive. Uh, and not just in Europe, but in virtually any society of the time, I think it would, it would be very difficult to come out with what they would know. So they would, uh, in all likelihood, maybe go about quietly under the radar. And so this is, would be the argument for a kind of uh, longstanding secret society of some sort or another. You know, people like Jim Mars, wrote about this and Rule by Secrecy. Um, I'm sure many people out there have read that excellent book. Um, and Manly P. Hall, much, much earlier than Jim, wrote about it in The Secret Teachings of the Ages, a book that uh, years ago when I read it uh, really turned my head around as well. So there are these concepts uh, based on good research that lead, uh, lead us to believe that, that there's a possibility of highly knowledgeable esoteric secret societies with powerful knowledge going back throughout human history. Um, is that related to these cases of human beings that seem to have this kind of telepathic capability? Well, I'm inclined to think that there's probably a connection of some sort or another. Uh, barring proof, I couldn't really tell you any other way. But uh, one thing I will say is that you know, claims of contact uh, that people have with human aliens, uh, I don't just dismiss out of hand like I used to. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll come back around and say that. Um, I don't believe every story out of hand just because it seems like a neat story. 
I don't think that's a very good way to do research either. But I have learned in the 25 years now that I've been researching UFOs in a very serious way, that this world that we live in, my friends, is much, much stranger than we are led to believe. It is much stranger than we are led to believe. We have very practical issues to deal with in this world. Um, that's right, we do. But beyond that, there is something else as well. And we need to remind ourselves every now and then that our own perceptions, our own thought processes will limit us very, very frequently in our, our manner of thinking about the world. Um, and that really the, the most sure path toward personal growth is continually reminding ourselves of these very limitations that we were born into and that very likely we retain a large number of them throughout our lives. Sometimes it's necessary to have, uh, you know, a worldview that gives coherence, right? We need, we do need that. But it's also, um, it's also the case that for those of us who uh, just can't help it but need to think outside the box, and there are people like that, that we need to ask questions and we need to challenge the comfortable views of reality that we thought we had, that we thought were just, this is how reality is, but no, it isn't. I'll repeat that, uh, that piece of wisdom by John Mack, I've, I've mentioned it a number of times, but it's worth repeating, which is simply that uh, the process of personal growth is the process of shedding illusions about oneself, about ourselves. Uh, you know, we get emotionally attached to all the things that we like to believe about ourselves. And uh, frequently, the things that we tell ourselves are uh, things that we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel good. But they're not always true. And uh, it's the same about our world. So uh, my opinion at this point is that, yes, there is a substantial element of what we call this UFO phenomenon. There are what appear to be definite non-humans, that is the greys and, and the insectoids and beyond. Yes, I believe this. Absolutely, I do. At least I continue to believe this. But there is a component that is entirely human looking. And when you really think about it, it's entirely logical that this would be so from a number of points of view. Uh, a, homegrown, uh, genetically tweaked human beings, um, and B, if, you're, if you are a non-human species, you want to infiltrate or you want to work with human civilization in one way or another, you would need your own supply of homegrown human beings to do that work for you. That would obviously be the case. So the real question, and I'm going to bring Tracy back here in a moment, is um, it comes down to one of two options, at least for me at this point that I'm thinking. So option number one is that it's a homegrown entirely human breakaway civilization from ancient times that's carried on its own esoteric traditions that is responsible for the what we call the UFO phenomenon. And maybe they have genetically modified what we call the reptoids and the greys and who knows what else. That's a possibility. I don't think that I think that that's the case. Listen to my grammar. I don't think that I think. I don't believe that that's the case, but you never know. And then the other possibility is that these are humans that were genetically modified by some other species and made to do work for them. So those are those are two possibilities. What I don't believe is that there are native human beings that evolved naturally on another planet. So that's where I'm at these days. That's, that's where I'm looking at when I uh, look at this phenomenon. Uh, you may have a different opinion. Hey, feel free to put your comments below after you watch this and we can continue this conversation. Right now, I think it might be a good idea to bring Tracy back Trace, do you want to yep. swing on back here? And we can uh, maybe take a few questions that you may have and, um, and see where this goes. We want to do this for an hour, so we've got about 15 minutes to go. Okay, let's have a look here. First of all, I want to thank some people. Since Richard's been here, uh, he doesn't know all the amazing uh, comments and that people have had and the super chats. I want to thank Mike Rossi right off the bat and Christine Siebel. We know you guys are always here. And uh, we're going to have a look at your questions in a sec. 
Just also want to thank Kicking Back in OC and Michael Morasco. Thank you so much. Thank you. You guys for your super chats. That means a lot. And if anybody, if everybody else is enjoying the show and you want to support Richard's work, uh, please like the video and uh, it really, it really helps him. It supports Richard. Uh, and also subscribe to the channel. You can sign up for notifications and you might want to check your notification settings. I've just been noticing some people are saying they, they didn't get the notification. So you can go in, uh, hit the bell. That's how, how you get notifications and you'll be notified whenever there's a new live video and whenever we post any video, but your settings in there will determine uh, where you're going to get that notification. So you might want to check on that as well. So uh, let's just have a quick peek here. At we have any, I'm sure we have something that's interesting here. One, one thing I always love is the, um, the questions from people who uh, follow this program. I'm just constantly amazed that there's just so many deeply thoughtful people who uh, bother to come in and uh, to hang out for the experience. So thank you for that in advance. So anything here? Okay. So we'll do this quick question from Mike. I know he's a big supporter. Um, Richard, have you ever gotten so frustrated that you wanted to grab the reputable UFO investigators and get them in the same room and say, what the bleep? Blankety blank. Why the bleep can't we all get on the same page and help move the football forward? <laughs> what do you think the problem is here? Why does it seem like we can't collaborate yeah. and move it forward what's the problem we're a little bit like what's hurting going on? we're a little like hurting cats like that is really the yeah i have to understand what we do um i've thought about this i had a conversation um once with nick redford about this very thing a couple of years ago and um to do this type of work it's um i i look at like the good researchers as like intellectual artists mm -hmm. in the sense that uh they go into this field really on their own They've got ideas that they're trying to work out, and uh, and so they get into their research, and they write their books, they write their articles. They're kind of like doing their own thing. So it's not, generally speaking, a collaborative type of intellectual endeavor, at least. Now, there's a lot of conversations we have back and forth. Um, like, I've talked with Nick Redfern about things. I've mm -hmm. talked with Linda and mm -hmm. uh, and Jim Mars when he was alive. And, mm -hmm. and you and Grant. And, and Grant Cameron. Yeah. And... It's it's true, and, and Steve Bassett, but but um, I mean, a most most people who do this, I can tell you right now, they struggle to survive. It's really tough. It's very very tough. That's number one. Number two, because they, so they, it's a labor of love for them. Number two is, um, you think about what UFOs really are. This is probably the most broad subject you can imagine. People say, oh, well, it's just about these unknown objects. We don't know what they are. No, it's way more than that. The study of UFOs incorporates uh, the study of politics. It incorporates the study of science, and not just one science, but multiple sciences, from propulsion technology to energy generation to space-time to dimensions to uh, you name it. It incorporates social theory. You know, how is it that this phenomenon affects our society or how is it, how are our thoughts about it uh, generated by social constructs and so forth? Um, and, and on and on, there's so many, you know, uh, other questions we can ask, you know, what will it be like if we end UFO secrecy or how can we end UFO secrecy? So you've got all of these uh, dedicated people approaching this subject with their own special uh, focus that that's important to them. So it's very difficult to get all of them to sort of work together mm -hmm. for one purpose. It, it's really, really tough. And um, on top of that, um, you know, how many, how many really excellent UFO researchers are there? Well, there's, there's some that are good researchers and good public speakers. There's some that are really great researchers, but not good public speakers. Um, there's some who are great researchers and very friendly. There's some who are great researchers and not very friendly because not everyone's not a everyone's friendly person. Not everyone's extroverted too. You know, no. some people are very or, introverted and they, exactly. it's so hard to bring this stuff out. Getting, I mean, you, we're talking about putting together like some kind of amazing dream team, but that's a tough thing to do, organizing. Um, I'll just say five, six plus years ago, I toyed with the idea of actually creating a, um, 
a rival UFO organization to MUFON. This is true. I didn't do it, and thank God I didn't. Um, but I was, I was. This is during my unofficial ban from. <laughs> it was from 2011 to 2017, and let's just say there were some issues there. And um, I thought very seriously about going down that road and starting something that um, would compete with them. And when I thought about the organizational nightmare that would be involved, yeah. I thought this is exactly not what my skill set would really be uh, made for. It's, it's, so organizing, um, what I'm trying to do right now at this phase mm -hmm. in 2018 and moving forward is some version of what that question was, which is... Right. You want to bring the global perspective in yeah. and, and start, uh, I don't want to speak for you, no, but, but that is what I know, something that Richard's really passionate about right now, and I love that. Yeah, I want to do so that. There's a little bit of that going on. I'm doing what little, very little I'm able to do, which is have as much of a global series of conversations as I can. I'm doing that through my KGRA show and then bringing that onto YouTube. But uh, it's tough. I, it's I just tough. want to add to like, it's tough when there's so many things pulling at you from so many directions, because like you were saying, you were trying to survive for so long mm -hmm. being a publisher of other people's books and all these different things that you did. Um, and so, and then you need your own time to just stay with your own thoughts and uh, dig yeah. through the mystery of your own perspective. Right. So, so there was very little time left for other people. So I, I see this with all the other researchers, yeah. you know, everyone has to sort of really, um, grab a hold of what little time they have to do their actual research. And so there was someone in there saying like, what about Graham Hancock? You know, I saw that a few times. What about Graham Hancock? Cause he talks about, uh, you know, origins as well. Oh yeah. And, but you'll find this, like there are, again, the, all these different specialties. You can't, you guys don't always have the time to collaborate or. What I would like to do is actually do an interview with Graham. I know. I, I think we should, we should set that up. That'd be some really point. cool. Uh, I've known Graham a long time and we uh, really like each other. And I certainly have a great deal of respect for mm -hmm. so much of what he has done over the years. Uh, you know, reading fingerprints of the gods back in the 1990s was uh, important for me, as I'm sure it was for many people watching this right now. It's a great book. And he's done so much work since then. So that would be a wonderful, uh, I think we'd all enjoy uh, hearing that interview. Here, yeah. You to collaborate and explore, you know, these different topics and um, yeah. theories. I, it would be nice. For me, the, the best thing that I can do is uh, continue to explore ideas within my own mind and <clears throat> bouncing things off of, of you and, and many of you out there, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, hopefully writing good books uh, in the future that can open more doors. And uh, that's... That's the best that I can try to water. do. Uh, thanks for the water. <laughs> so, okay. How about uh, okay. next question? Okay. We've got we've got about uh, seven minutes, looks like. Okay. So we're just going to jump down. There are, there's always a few people asking about different names. That, uh, I'm not sure. Let's see. I don't want to do names right now. <laughs> okay. that, that's a quick way to get me into trouble. <laughs> okay. Let's go. Have you ever read the Janos people book the abduction story if so what's your opinion on the veracity of the story are you familiar with that one or no if if not we'll go to another question uh that might be something that moira actually mentioned in her uh in one part of her book um and um i don't want to comment yet how about how about i come back to that i think this is a theme that i do want to hit uh, again uh but the J is, I think it might be Janus. Um, oh, could be. It might be. I, I don't know. I, I don't have know a question that I saw in there that I really want to ask you, but I'll leave it up to you if you want to pass for oh, wait, another the, time. If the Janus right, story so. refers to the United Kingdom in the 1950s, then um, then I would just say that it's an intriguing story. And I, uh, let me look back into it and I'll come back for more. Okay. okay sorry. Okay, so you can either pass and save this for another time, but of course, this is uh, you'll know right away that it's a selfish request that someone had in there. I love it. What about a Battlestar Galactica scenario for our species? <laughs> <laughs> Origins. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, involving AI, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Eventually, our uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah, I mean, you can see this right now. Here we are. We're sort of on this crazy cusp 
with AI. Right. And you can see how there is potential with singularity for AI to run amok. That's right. And, uh, you know, if it grows exponentially, uh, what could happen with runaway AI? This is the Battlestar Galactica theme. What would happen to humanity? Would humanity stand a chance? Um, and so when, I don't want to give away the whole series. Well, here, here's the thing. I'm so, in danger you, of giving away the entire yeah, series here. That would be a bad thing. Okay, yeah, So that, we, we watched I Battlestar. That. Yeah, it's one of uh, my favorites. <laughs> great show. You got to watch Battlestar at least yeah. once. You haven't seen so it. So the ending is actually, it's a beautiful ending. It's, uh, it's a beautiful ending to the whole series. But let's just say it has to do with. There's a lot of good stuff to think about in there, yeah. It has to do with um, um, humans encountering uh fighting the AI that they had themselves created. And then of course that figures into the origins of a little place called the people on earth. And we'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Is that hopefully that's not too much, but we're, we're looking at, um, you know, a scenario in which we are going to have some version of advanced, strong artificial intelligence, whether that's going to create w what people call a singularity or not. Um, I think sometimes there are researchers who take it as a given that there's going to be this singularity. In other words, AI running so far muck that we will no longer be able to control it. That's, I, that's essentially where. Yeah, it is. I would say I, I uh, I'm one of those people. I, I, I think, don't mean to be a pessimist with it, but I can't yeah. see how it won't be exponential growth. I, I can't see how we can yeah. keep a lid on it. Um, that's just my opinion. I think I'm with you on this. I, I've been kind of in that camp for a long time as mm -hmm. well. But uh, just lately, I've been asking myself, is, does it really have to be that way? Is it actually going to be uh, where runaway computing intelligence will um, see itself as no longer needing its human masters? I don't know. Um, possibly. Possibly not. Um, I want to come back with that. Uh, it's a great I'm going to talk topic. about this with you. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about this. I really want to do this for a future episode. Mm -hmm. Definitely Live one stream. of my favorite topics too. So. Yeah, for that one, it's just we have to stay on together and just we have to riff. We have to figure out how we can talk about Battlestar Galactica without giving it all away. <laughs> yeah. Just watch it. <laughs> Thanks for the cool question. All right, great. <laughs> uh, okay, let me see. Here. Maybe one more question. Okay. One more question. We're going to try to keep this to an hour and and uh, as much as possible. Uh, Lately, we've been doing these, and they've been going often almost as long as 90 minutes. And uh, I think a 60-minute, you've got to understand, it, it's uh, hard, especially on a weekly basis, to do them a lot longer all the time. So thanks for your understanding. Let's try to do one more question, maybe two, and we'll we'll bang it out. Richard, have you read the MIT? Christine. Oh, Christine Siebel. Okay. Yeah. Have I read the MIT paper on the future of our civilization on Earth? It's a must-read. Wow. Uh, I don't know if this is a recent paper or not. It sounds like it would be. And Christine, thanks for mentioning it. I'll make this promise to you. By the time we come back next week, I will have read it. And um, I'll make a comment on it, at least in the end, if not somewhere else. So thanks for mentioning it. No, I haven't read it. Okay, here's a question. What do you think about the mythology of the Anunnaki? Not necessarily Sitchin's interpretation, just in general. Do you think the non-human humans could be modern day Anunnaki. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I've thought about this so frequently, so often. Um, long pause. Looking off into the distance. <laughs> you want to pass? No, I don't want to pass. Okay. I think... Okay. Um, I think that the, um, the confluence of stories in our ancient myth, it's not just the Anunnaki, it's not just the Sumerians, um, but of stories from all these different cultures of the sky gods and, um, and the like, the gods who bequeath civilization. Um, I think that that we have been tweaked in one way or another. I think we've been, I think we've been managed in some way. And by managed, I don't necessarily mean micromanaged in a bad way, but I think that there have been watchers or overseers or, or something of this sort, uh, probably throughout our existence, very probably. 
Um, having said that, I, I don't don't take literally the interpretation that so many people have of of uh, the tablets that Sitchin has, you know, Zechariah Sitchin claimed to have uh, translated. And, and it has to be pointed out, by the way, that scholars of cuneiform, which is those tablets, what they're written in, have taken strong, strong issue with the translation frequently of what Zechariah Sitchin has said, at least in certain in many instances. Now, I'm not a scholar of cuneiform and I couldn't tell you, but I do know that there's a lot of disagreement about this. So to argue therefore that the Anunnaki had been here for hundreds of thousands of years, which is what the apparently the clay tablets read. Um, you know, here's the thing, just because an ancient people say something doesn't mean that you're obligated to take it literally, all right? Taking things literally is what children do. As we grow older, we realize you don't always want to take expressions literally. Um, but having said that, I, I leave, I, I think that there is a real possibility in analyzing our ancient mythos from cultures around the world that yes, they're, they're referring to something that is extraordinary and, and not us. So I'll leave it at that for now and, and we could probably come back to that at some point. Okay, uh, lots of really cool questions in there. Drew, you had a really cool question as well. I think one more. Um, but we might want to save it for next week if we're going to get <laughs> to artificial intelligence because oh, your, yes. your question is more along the lines of uh, transhumanism and you said transgenics and uh, you know modifying ourselves. What's that going to look like? Uh, so I think we're going to save that question. It's an amazing question. Well, yeah, we'll come back uh, to. save it. And we're so we're gonna we'll do um, a future. So in fact, I really would like to do one on transhumanism yeah. soon or AI. Me too. Uh, mainly because I'm doing a lecture on it in uh, Missouri next month, and it would be yeah. good for me to get into the mind space. Uh, we were driving back today, and what were we talking about doing for next week? Do you remember? Because I can't remember. We had a really good theme, and I wanted to get into it next week. It wasn't. It wasn't UFOs. No, it was a little more. And no, it was about um, what happened on Facebook today. Oh yeah, Facebook. Uh, well, just in the last day or two, not only did they ban uh, Alex Jones and Infowars, they just banned a um, Venezuelan site, uh, a left-leaning uh, Venezuelan news site. Uh, um, Tele. Oh golly, I, I can't remember. Anyway, I was just reading about it earlier today, and I thought, good grief, what's going on? Uh, more censorship, but I don't think that's what I wanted to talk about. Uh, well, you mentioned that because, but we decided we wanted to really do UFOs today. Yeah, there was another theme. Um, you were talking about, um, I don't know if I missed this when I was reading the chat, but could, I know I think you were talking about could a small group, hmm? is that what you're talking about? Were you talking about could you grow beings? Was it, well, we were, was it in that discussion? No, no, we, were, we had a long car ride. ride today. We drove back from Canada. Five hours, we go through all sorts of this stuff. And I didn't Check write it. down what I wanted to discuss next week. I thought, this is a good topic, and I almost did it for tonight, and we didn't. But we, yeah, but we liked this one. It wasn't, it wasn't you, the censorship. I'm going to give you one more else. thing. Someone said, what do you think of the 411 books? Oh, well, I'm a huge fan of David Pilates. Um, I'll just say, since we've got this here, that... Um, Couple of things. So I've chatted with David recently. I'm going to interview him, uh, do a fresh interview with him for the Richard Dolan show before this year is out. Hopefully probably in October. Yeah. So that, that's yep. going to happen. I'm quite sure. Um, David and I uh, are very familiar with each other's research, and you know, if you don't know who David is, he's he's really the only person doing serious work on these really mysterious, inexplicable in many cases, disappearances of individuals, primarily from the United States National Park System. Um, disappearances that some can be explained in conventional ways and, and some I just think cannot, cannot be explained in conventional ways. So it leads you to the conclusion, leads me to the conclusion that there's uh, an agency, a group, uh, uh, a civilization, a society that has incredibly advanced capability at just snatching people up um, and taking them for whatever reasons. Now, are they related to what we call the UFO phenomenon? Well, I think it's entirely possible. Yes, absolutely. It's entirely possible. Um, Spooky. Yeah. So anyway, the, the 411 books I, I consider to be uh, just superb. I've got a bunch of them. 
Uh, here, I'm just gonna go right off, right here on the shelves. I got three of them. David, this this plug is for you. So there's a few. <laughs> There's more. We got more lying around here. No, you love reading those books, and big fan. Uh, Very big fan of David Pilates. I sort of love that you like reading those books because I never want to go in a national park ever again. Uh, that's <laughs> no, the result of of those books. There was one question I saw just scrolling up. I just mentioned it here about the Allagash abduction case, and um, just for the record, um, you and I saw two of those mm -hmm. individuals just again recently. We were in Newport, Rhode Island, um, and that was uh, Jim Weiner and um, and Chuck uh, Fultz, both of whom are just superb guys. Um, they're two, Jack is Jack is Jim's twin brother, and um, I, I really wish Jack uh, the best of health. He hasn't been feeling well for a little while now, but uh, that was an event that took place in 1976, and in my view, that was absolutely 100% genuine event where you have four young men in the Allagash forests of Maine. It's dense forests and this is not a not a place that you just go cavalierly like people can die there. It's very very uh, rugged wilderness. Uh, these are four young guys who were good at camping and they went out uh, but had an experience on one night where they were taken. They were definitely taken and um, in which uh, over the years um, enough uh, research and hypnotic regression was done where all of them independently recalled exactly the same type of uh, compatible types of memories of being taken, and it's fascinating. Uh, they were all, especially the three of them, um, one of the gentlemen really kind of fell off the map, but, the, uh, but Jack and Jim and, and Chuck all seemed to have been very, very deeply affected, positively affected, in their mental development um, by the event. That's a whole other story, but uh, they're great guys and 100% genuine, which I'm sure you would agree with. I met absolutely them. agree. Yeah, I was really excited to meet them and uh, amazing people. I yeah. definitely think of them very, as very credible. For sure. And uh, of course, I wanted to know if they'd had any, any other experiences. So, um, that's always a fascinating thing that maybe we can talk about sometime. Maybe we can. Uh, catch up with them for an interview as well. Yeah, even I really just a short need one, to. Me too. Because uh, there are some fascinating stories even beyond the one everybody knows. For sure. Yeah. So I think we're getting close to that time. Yeah, we're running a little over and I'm, I'm going to try to be the hard nose here. Yeah. If you enjoyed the show, please like the show for Richard. And if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do. It's a great way to support him. And uh, sign up for notifications so you know when his new videos are being released. And uh, you'll know when the next live show is. But for now, we want you to know that this is the time slot we're going to go with uh, until we let you know. But this is going to be the regular time slot, Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. That's right. And just to wrap up a couple things, uh, we have two websites. Thank you. Thank you for the super chat. We could we could see it going up here. Kraya? Yeah. CLP. Thank you very, very much. Oh, thank you. Um, the two websites. So Richard Dolan Press, where you can check out all of the other books that Richard publishes by other authors. And mine. And uh, you just released a new book. Yes, uh, Bruce Maccabee. This took a while for me to get the cover right, but it's out now. And it's Bruce Maccabee's uh, Legacy of 1952, Year of the UFO. I need to put uh, uh, current links on there to the Amazon download. But the book's available on Amazon. Please do check it out. I'm going to have my own copy here uh, shortly, and I'll be able to show you. Very, very excellent book. Bruce Maccabee is a fantastic UFO researcher, been doing this for a long time. And this is all about one of the most significant years in the history of UFOs, 1952. Bruce breaks it down. And really, he's one of the best qualified people to do it. Fabulous book. Great. And so that's Richard Dolan Press. And then the site that we are on the most is uh, richarddolanmembers.com. That's sort of the active site where we have, uh, we put up free content that anyone can go and see. Anyone can go. Careful. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> anyone can go there and uh, check out the events tab and know what Richard's got coming up.
We also have uh, different content for subscribers. We always do APRE interviews after KGRA, uh, just candid interviews that we'll do with whoever we've got going on. We keep um, it interesting. We have uh, AMAs for members. We have uh, blog posts, podcasts, lots of different things. Uh, so you can all check that out, too, if that interests you. And the other thing I'll just mention is for the rest of this year now, we're in the middle of August, uh, I have a lot of writing that I'm going to be doing. So uh, I feel very active. I feel very energized. Uh, you're a big part of that reason. Thank you. And uh, But I feel very engaged. So there's a lot that I want to write, a lot that I need to write. Uh, so look for uh, new, new material in published form. Uh, that includes uh, at least one... A uh, hundred page, ninety page booklet that um, will be out, but then longer works. I am not, I have not forgotten about that false flag book, and I have definitely not forgotten about doing UFOs, National Security State, Volume Three. It's going to happen. Not, not this year, but I'll be working on these projects for the rest of the year and well into next year. And I'm pushing him on audiobooks all the time. Yes, it will happen. <laughs> audiobooks, audiobooks. Yeah. So I think that's about it. We'll just tell you we have, uh, as we were saying, there's a transhumanism conference that Richard is doing in the middle of September, the 14th to the 16th. That's in Missouri. And uh, you can go to the conference or you can live stream that conference. We have links to that in our calendar. Uh, at so Richard Dolan Members. At com under the events tab. You can go in there, look in September. And uh, all the links are there if you're interested in checking it out. All right. But for now, I, I see more great questions. Uh, We're going to save through. them. We're going to save them. We'll save them and come back. Thank you for the amazing comments. Thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, Michael and Lori. They're amazing as Pursuing X for moderating this chat. We couldn't do it without them. Thank you. And uh, we hope you have a great night. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks for coming out. We'll do this again next week. Yeah. Bye. Bye.